it's a pleasure. Okay, so it's it's a great pleasure to speak to you, uh, and uh, I'm sorry I've upset your schedule, uh, but your time did not really suit Sydney. Uh, of course, this is a problem we have generally in uh, having international talks uh, is find the time that suits everybody. But in any case, uh, welcome to you all. Uh, what I thought I'd speak to is uh, the work we're doing with uh, exceptionally long-lived individuals, whether they could serve as models of healthy aging, and in particular, healthy brain aging. So as you know, uh, with aging, there is decline in many brain functions. And if you actually look at brain volumes, they continue to decline well into <clears throat> the 11th decade of life. So just to show you some images here uh, of uh, individuals, say, at the age of 20, age of 40, and then 100. And you see that there is atrophy in all the brain compartments. You see atrophy of gari, just visualizing of sulci, and large ventricular system. And in fact, the brain shrinks in weight by about 5% at the age of 70 and about 20 by 20% 20 at the age of 90 years. So there is significant atrophy happening uh, in the brain uh, with aging. And there are there's also accumulation of pathology. So and one, one index of that pathology might be looking at white matter hyperintensities. And you can see that a 40-year-old brain is generally free of white matter hyperintensity. You see a small thin pencil line along the ventricular wall. But then by the time you are in your 60s, you start seeing uh, some hyperintensities uh, in, in the brain. On This is beta T2 weighted flare images. But if you look at a brain of a 100-year-old, you see a lot of white matter pathology in that brain. And I can actually show you a couple of brains from our uh, Sydney Centenarian study. So you look at this, this brain. This is a brain of 101-year-old woman who had 11 years of education. When she, we assessed her, her mini mental state score was 19. And her, uh, on the Addenbrooks, she scored 58 out of 100, so 100. So she really had significant cognitive impairment, but she was still fairly independent and quite robust in the fact that she agreed to go into an MRI scanner. But you see the degree of atrophy, you see the ventricular dilatation, you see uh, and here on the left are T1 weighted images. You can see atrophy, which is fairly generalized. And on the right uh, are the flare images. And you can see again significant white matter hyperintensities, which are uh, quite confluent and, uh, in fact, probably uh, encompass about half the white matter. Now, this is another patient, also a woman of 101, who had six years of education. Now, she was cognitively quite well. In fact, scored 29 out of 30 on the MMSC and 85 out of 100 on the Adam Brooks. But she also had significant atrophy, perhaps not to the same degree, and also had significant white matter lesions, including some lacoons in her brain. You can see a lacoon here, uh, and uh, even here, the possibility of lacoons on a T1 age as well. So you see a lot of vascular pathology and generalized atrophy. So we try to see, okay, what, what is the pattern of this atrophy, uh, the structural change in the brain as it ages? So what we've done here is combine two studies, a Sydney Centurion study, which actually took people from the age 95 onwards and uh, people in the study are 95 to 103. And then the Sydney Memory and Aging study, which uh, was largely 70 to 90 years. And uh, uh, we actually looked at people with dementia and without dementia, and we first present data from people without dementia in uh, these two studies who had also MRI scans. So you, 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 I divided them into age bands of 10, so the 70s, 80s, 90s, 100 plus. Of course, in this age group, there are only five participants. As you can see, uh, their mini mental state scores are reasonably good mean scores, although they, they did differ significantly, but the difference was not really very marked. Uh, and we, even though these are non-demented, we divided them into those with mild 
cognitive impairment and those without. The high functioning ones, about half of them uh, actually had uh, no cognitive impairment and half of them had maybe perhaps mild cognitive impairment. Uh, although it's a, it's a difficult determination in very old people uh, to diagnose mild cognitive impairment in that group is hard because we do not have good normative data for the, uh, that population and almost everybody, in fact, everybody has some degree of cognitive uh, impairment. Uh, so, uh, and this, the five who did come into the scanner were actually well, quite well functioning. <clears throat> I just wanted, want you to keep this in mind that about nearly about half of the population is high functioning and half is not, not so well functioning, but still not, uh, did not get the diagnosis of dementia. And you can see, of course, the FOE4 carriage here, uh, and this is the usual uh, population prevalence that you would expect, 20, 25%, but the older population certainly has a much lower E4, and in the, of the 500 year old, 100 plus, no one has E4. And we'll come to this issue of FOI protein E uh, subsequently as well. So we look at their uh, brain structures. We look at the total brain matter volume, you can see that there is a decline from the 70s going onwards. So it's kind of a linear decline. And similarly for white matter lesions, there is a decline. Seems to flatten here, but the numbers towards the end really are not very many. So I think that this could be somewhat artifactual as well. See a much steeper decline in hippocampal volumes. And also if you see the white matter hyperintensities, see a marked increase towards the later part of life. Right? So it's, uh, it, it's increasing uh, through the 70s and 80s, but towards the, in the 90s and beyond, it really ma increases markedly in white matter lesions. The other thing you will notice is that uh, there are two lines here. There is uh, one estimate, that the solid line is estimate all people, and the, the uh, interrupted line is the one which is estimate for high functioning people. You can find that there is really no difference. They, they, they are actually overlapping each other. So the high functioning individuals are also declining in their white matter, in their white matter, uh, and the gray matter volume, in the hippocampal volume, and uh, also accumulating white matter lesions. Perhaps maybe slightly less degree than uh, the, the total population, but but you can uh, see that there is this thing that even though they're structurally the brains are changing, like everyone else, but Functionally, they are performing better. So something is keeping them uh, uh, performing at a better level. Okay. So if you actually then look at particular brain structures, you find that uh, if these are the green are the uh, volumes for the younger population, 70 to 89, and the blue is blue and pink the population for uh, the population are, which is older, 90 plus. And you can see that gray matter volume, of course, it's lower for the 90 plus. White matter volume is lower for the 90 plus as well. Subcortical volumes, same thing. And again, high functioning and the rest of the population is really not very different. Uh, you, you will notice that for both gray matter, white matter. What, what you, is uh, notable, noteworthy is that for subcortical volumes, yes, the high functioning individuals are maintaining slightly better volumes than the uh, uh, rest of the population that is not so high function. So there, there is this dif difference in subcortical volumes that seem to be better preserved in certain individuals seems to, and appears to be contributing to uh, better functioning uh, possibly in these individuals. Now here we've looked at people from 70 onwards uh, to 100 plus. So let's look at uh, the, the lifespan, and this is not our data, but data from another study. But but overall, the, uh, over the lifespan, the reduction in brain structures seems to be linear uh, in certain regions, but in certain other structures, uh, there is stability in the earlier years, and then there is uh, more greater decline in later years. Uh, so it's a quadratic kind of a model rather than a totally linear model. And here. 
uh, these various structures are plotted and the means are plotted, as you can see. These are non-demented individuals, uh, healthy individuals from the age of 18 to 94. Of course, we're looking at age-related change, but using cross-sectional data. So, and one must remember with cross-sectional data that uh, there is always this uh, concern that there might be cohort effects. Uh, and ideally, one should have longitudinal data. And this group did have longitudinal data on a sub subsample, but that was only for a year. So you really cannot uh, say very much from that. And of course, you can't have longitudinal data that spans 60 or 70 years in one uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, investigation, one research group's uh, uh, lifespan per se. So uh, you can see that most many of these structures have a linear decline with age. Uh, there are some structures, we have several white matter, you see relatively st stable uh, volumes until the age of about 60 or so, and then you start seeing a uh, fairly rapid decline. And in the hippocampus, you see this pattern of uh, decline occurring from the age of 25 or so uh, to 60, and then of course it becomes more rapid subsequently. So in fact, some people have tried to look at, uh, and the same thing about ventricular volume. So you see that uh, volume seem to rise uh, quite significantly later in the piece, uh, after the age of 60 or 70 years. So people said, okay, are there critical ages at which declines occur? Uh, and especially when you're seeing the hippocampus of the civil white matter, where you see, you don't see a linear pattern, uh, strictly, and uh, and estimated age trajectories and critical ages have been suggested. Uh, uh, say for the, uh, several cortex, uh, these two ages were suggested: white matter, uh, mid forties, and then uh, early eighties. And then, of course, for hippocampus, more like between fifty and sixty was suggested as a critical age after which change occurs. Now, it's really. Uh, I don't think all the data support this, uh, and it's not really very clear about, as to why there should be these critical ages of decline. But I think one would try to understand why this is happening. And uh, you can see when you're looking at volumes over a lifespan, there are uh, different events that you're looking at. You're looking at developmental events earlier on in life, which uh, lead to uh, possibly an increase in volume and then a stability in volume. Of brain structures. And then, of course, you're seeing degenerative events. And there are primary degenerative events, which are part and parcel of that uh, brain's uh, development and formation, per se. Uh, so, and these are smaller fibers that are being lost. And then, of course, there are secondary degenerative events where large malnated fibers are lost uh, and uh, neuronal uh, loss occurs. And that occurs later in life, after the age of 75, more so. So it's a combination of these events, the developmental events, the primary degenerative events, and secondary degenerative events that one eventually sees in terms of this uh, uh, trajectory. And it seems that these secondary degenerative events uh, accelerate towards the, the end of life. And they continue, as we are seeing, well into the 11th decade of life. And it, seems that there are no sex differences in these age trends, uh, strictly speaking. There was sex difference in caudate observed, but not much else really. And also uh, this group, uh, Raz's group showed that larger brain size to start off with or higher educational attainment did not really change the trajectory significantly. So this seems to be determined uh, perhaps uh, genetically or it seems to be pre-programmed uh, in terms of your path through life, uh, more so than other factors. So what happens to the cortex? Uh, are there uh, different regions of the cortex that are more vulnerable than others? Uh, so this is uh, data from our Sydney Centenarian study and uh, PhD student Yang uh, Shao, uh, 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 Shahua Yang who look, looked at this uh, data and did a surface analysis of cortical thickness. So the top figures, uh, top panels, two panels, are change in millimeter per decade. So she com again combined the Sydney memory aging study and the Sydney centenary study. 
uh, it will get 70 to 103 or so. The bottom actually looks at the p-values, uh, and you can see that uh, there are some regions that uh, if you get p-values, which the turquoise, these are the very significant changes in the frontal regions and the temporal regions, superior temporal region in particular, then some uh, parietal regions. Uh, you, you will see that uh, there is this one region that has a red color suggesting that it increases in volume rather than decreases in volume. But I would caution you here because the p-value here is really low. And when you actually look at the number of comparisons, I wouldn't put too much faith in this. We weren't totally convinced that we found regions that were clearly showing increase in volumes with aging, uh, with especially uh, very late stages in life. And this is uh, something that has been shown by other, others as well, that actually look at the cortex, uh, the two regions that seem to actually uh, show the strongest effect uh, um, are the superior and inferior frontal gari and superior part of the temporal. They actually show the greatest change uh, with, with aging. And uh, this is actually plots it in terms of uh, cross-sectional estimates of yearly difference in lobar volumes as a percentage of head size. And this is from the family and heart study. You can see the frontal lobe shows the greatest change and then the temporal lobe, less so parietal and occipital lobes. And uh, the thinning, cortical thinning continues into the 11th decade of life. So, so I think that's one thing that is emerging that it doesn't really stop. It doesn't seem, even though there is a lot of selection, the people who reach the age of 100 or 100 plus uh, are very select population. Because they, all the peers have died. But even then, they are continuing to actually show uh, this loss in their brains. And what seems to determine this? And uh, this is not our data, but we've done similar uh, analysis uh, on slightly younger people uh, in the, from our older Australian twin study looking at the heritability uh, of uh, the. Uh, cortical thickness and change in uh, brain volume. And it does seem that uh, there is a strong genetic component to it. Uh, you can see that this, this is, uh, the colors show that this is the heritability map. And uh, again, looking at the surface, uh, the thickness here did not show much heritability, but if you look at the surface area of the cortex, that seemed to be uh, reasonably heritable with up to 0.7 heritability. And this is what we, we actually saw in our data as well, uh, that we had significant cortical thickness and significant uh, heritability. Okay, so next let's, let's look at dementia in centenarians. And I'll present two sets of data here. And the first data I want to present is uh, from our International Centenarian Consortium. Now there are uh, 17 studies now in this international consortium, and we had data from 14 studies uh, uh, which looks at dementia. So here it's looking at just the prevalence of dementia. This is from around the world. You can see there are studies from Europe, uh, US, a 90 plus study from Europe, from, and also from uh, Asia and uh, Australia, the Sydney Centenary study. And if you look at to the right, this is the mean prevalence, dementia prevalence in men, uh, about 53%. This is in individuals over the age of 95, uh, about half of them have dementia. And if you actually look at people over the age of 100, uh, about, in women, about two thirds of them have dementia, and men, 55% have dementia. And this is the other thing that we observe that is men who reach that age, uh, are generally healthier, both physically healthier as well as cognitively healthy. And that, that probably is just selection bias. We believe that uh, because women uh, outnumber men by four to one at that age, age 100 plus, the men uh, die of other causes uh, before that. So the ones who do reach that age are definitely much more robust. Uh, and if you actually look at uh, their cognitive domains, and here I'm just looking at the mini mental state examination and divide that into domains, attention, language, orientation, recall, and registration. 
you can see that even at that age, 95 to 100, 100 105 plus, you're seeing decline. And we've seen that, I'm not presenting that data, we've seen that in our longitudinal study, in the citizen engineering study, that these individuals continue to decline uh, cognitively and uh, in fact, sometimes quite rapidly. So that's why we assess them every six months uh, to be able to, uh, especially of course, their lifespan over the age of 100 is of only what a year or so on, on the average. Uh, so you have to see them more frequently, but they are continuing to decline. And then we, we okay, say, okay, what is what are the determinants? Of course, age is a strong determinant. Uh, and if you look at the 95 plus, also get, uh, in terms of uh, de developing dementia, uh, age uh, is a strong determinant. Sex, uh, as I said, uh, is a determinant as well because men are less likely to have dementia. But uh, surprisingly, education also emerged when you pool the data to be significant. Also, the effect size was small, uh, only 0.95. So it had a small effect, a significant effect that even at that age, years of education uh, seemed to be protective um, against uh, dementia. Although not the same effect size as you might see in a uh, somewhat younger population. We did, we performed analyses to look at other potential risk factors, say vascular risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, look at visual hearing impairment, smoking, and BMI, and none of them was significant. Uh, but you must remember that these are uh, histories or current investigation. We do not have very good lifetime data to be able to do very fine grained analyses of these individuals. So, but what does emerge is that these, these risk factors that we generally associate with dementia at, uh, in, yeah, in younger populations, say, we look at 70 year olds or 80 year olds, we uh, often do see these as risk factors. At, at the extreme end of life, uh, these do not seem to be significant risk factors for dementia. Now, what, what is the picture when we look at the people with dementia? Now, again, we're looking at these uh, age bands, uh, 70 to 9, 80, 80 to 90, 90 to 100, and 100, over 100. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the uh, age, uh, say the mini mental state examination here, even though they've been diagnosed with dementia, uh, mini mental state score over the age of 100 is much lower. Now, APOE uh, also stands out uh, here, and it's worth pointing out that when you look at uh, the younger population here, say in the 70s, it's for 50% are APOE4 positive, uh, the demented group. And as you go up, the, that percentage goes down. In the 90s, only 11% are APOE4 positive. So again, uh, that E4 carriage, firstly, it puts the overall prevalence of E4 in the very old goes down. And then, of course, uh, its relationship to dementia uh, becomes weaker. And that's really, that's an interesting observation of that. So when you actually try to see, okay, in terms of their brain parameters, what predicts, what differentiates dementia from no dementia. And again, you see this, that same pattern. And you actually look at younger populations, you see that it's easier to separate the two groups out uh, in terms of the cortex, hippocampal volume in particular. Here when you see, as you look at the older populations, uh, you, uh, it's more difficult to separate out dementia from non-dementia. So here with white matter hyperintensity is really, there's no difference between people with dementia uh, without the or, or in fact, uh, mean actually values here, but of course it's not a significant uh, difference from between the two groups. So that's the other, that's the other the mismatch between pathology and dementia uh, is uh, something that we see. Uh, and if you look at uh, trying to use these in logistic regression, to get cortical volume, hippocampal volume, uh, and deep white mountain densities, the odds of being able to distinguish between dementia and non-dementia is much higher in a younger age, at 80 years. But if you look at 95 years, the uh, 
the odds become much lower of being able to distinguish two groups. So um, the, the same thing with, uh, the, with looking at cortical regions in particular. So if you look at cortical thickness uh, and in various regions and see you can distinguish between dementia and non-dementia. In a, at 80, it's easier, although still uh, often not significant, but it's easier, it's much more robust. And uh, it, uh, as you can see here, most of these odds ratios at 95 are not significant. Only this one, mean thickness overall, just reaches the significance level. Okay, so next we said, okay, let's, if you're looking at structure, it's not helping you very much. Uh, what about function? And let's look at their networks. And uh, so initially we looked at their anatomical networks using DTR. And if you look at say, using graph theory and you look at global efficiency of the network, uh, you find that with age there is a gradual reduction in global efficiency. There are other parameters we looked at. Um, and uh, this has been supported by other studies as well, that with healthy adult aging, there is there are changes in uh, 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 brain connectivity. Now, uh, the, the previous one was structural, now then we're going on to functional connectivity. And here, two things seem to be emerging in terms of functional connectivity. And this is using resting state fMRI. That when you actually look at uh, different, uh, say, systems, functional systems, subsystems within the brain, uh, that you find that as we age, there is within that subsystem, uh, usually within a subsystem, there is very strong connectivity. And in younger brains, the connectivity between systems is not as strong as within the system. Now that same pattern seems to change that decre there is decreasing connectivity within functional brain systems as we age and increasing connectivity between different functional systems, right? So the connectivity becomes more, more diffuse. So I'll just, let me show you this. Uh, uh, now here, uh, this is, uh, uh, various systems, uh, functional systems that have been looked at, uh, the somatomotor, uh, sensory motor systems and association systems. Uh, as you can see, the default mode, frontal parietal cortical, mental attention, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a map of these systems. You can see there is strong connectivity within the, uh, the functional brain system and not as strong connectivity between the systems. But as you grow older, this, uh, seems to get this up, especially certain systems like here, this the, the single opercular system you can see here, and also uh, the uh, the uh, what system is this? The um, let me just see the same ones. So, yeah, the single opercular system in particular. Yeah, this one is the one that seems to be affected the most. And uh, uh, the attention, dorsal attention system as well seems to uh, become a bit more acute. So what is happening is that the uh, functional systems become uh, less connected within themselves and become more connected between, uh, be, uh, be, uh, so there is less segregation. So it's a kind of a desegregation kind of a process that is happening with age. And when we looked at our uh, individuals and we said, okay, uh, with, within the centenarians, we, we looked at, say, um, or centenarians and knee centenarians, we looked at the centenarians who were demented and those who were not demented. So we had 46 who were not demented and 58 who were commonly impaired, uh, unimpaired comparison group, uh, group. So we are here, we are comparing uh, the centenarians who are non-demented with a controlled group of younger population in the 70s who are also uh, cognitively unimpaired. And what we found was that in the centenarians who were not impaired, there was stronger bilateral connectivity compared to the controlled population. 
and uh, in particular the connectivity between the frontoparietal cortical networks. And when we actually looked at the default mode network and its connectivity to the frontotemporal parietal network, in fact, that was reduced in the centenarians compared to uh, the control population. So what this is suggesting is that the centenarians who had been able to maintain their cognitions had increased bilateral connectivity. This is using functional data, so bilateral functional connectivity. And this uh, has been suggested as possibly a compensatory mechanism, although there are other possible uh, explanations given as well. And this actually reminds you of uh, Cabeza's work earlier, uh, in which he showed that when young people, this is using uh, uh, activation paradigm, that uh, young people are performing a task, a memory task, and you're seeing activation predominantly uh, with unilateral. And old people also performing the task who are not doing so well. well actually, they're failing the task. They're seeing a lot more activation, a broader area of activation, but again, it is unilateral. And this is old population that is actually performing as well as the young population. And they're showing bilateral activation. And Cabeza proposed that this was a compensation, that these are able to recruit the other side of the brain to compensate for the loss. Whereas uh, other people have said, look, this actually suggests that there's de differentiation, the desegregation that uh, we've seen in the uh, functional networks previously. Uh, so, and this is very similar to the, uh, what we saw, bilateral uh, connectivity of the uh, front parietal cortical networks in uh, the resting state. Uh, fMRI or cognitively uh, unimpaired or non-demented centenarians. So uh, what we're seeing here is, of course, also some disconnect between functional and structural connectivity. Uh, the trajectories of the functional connectivity are more in line with the timing of the white matter changes uh, than the gray matter changes, according to Zo. Uh, and Lindbergh has suggested that decline in functional connectivity appears to occur notably later in life than is reported in structural connectivity, which may suggest that the brain actively maintains patterns of functional interaction for as long as possible, despite changes in underlying structural integrity of the underlying connectivity. So essentially what we're seeing is initially I presented data, which was structural data showing the structural changes we were seeing in the brain. Then we're seeing that Cognitively, some of them are able to maintain their cognition in spite of the structural change. And here we're seeing that, yes, they can maintain functional connectivity in spite of the structural change until a later stage. So that seems to go together, so it makes sense really as to, uh, there is some, some mechanism by which functional connectivity can be maintained. Now let's look at other, other, look at pathology in the brain. So we look at amyloid imaging. We see that amyloid uh, deposition, these are amyloid positivity, uh, in a large, uh, this is composite data for nearly 2,000, uh, 3,000 participants. Look at MCI, which is as high as nearly 80%, uh, 75% in uh, the age of about 100. And even the people who are, uh, who have subjective cognitive impairment, but no uh, uh, objective evidence of cognitive impairment, uh, their uh, positivity rates are pretty high when they reach uh, their 90s. Uh, uh, over 40%. And uh, in fact, if you look at people who are FOE4 positive, even if they have no cognitive impairment, they have subjective cognitive impairment, but no objective, their positivity rates are as high as 70% when, when they are in their early 80s. People who are FOE4 negative have low rates, but they still have significant uh, positivity rates of amyloid. And this actually the very few studies of uh, amyloid uh, imaging in very old people. This is one study, 90 plus study that looked at a uh, few individuals. It wasn't a very large study, only 13 individuals. And they saw some relationship to amyloid. Uh, SU, these are SUVR ratio, and this is the total score on 3MS. And you can see a relationship. Although well, the data points are too infrequent, I think. To, be, uh, to put a lot of emphasis on this. 
but they did see that the, the ones who were A beta negative, MLOD negative, seemed to be stable, whereas the ones who were MLOD positive were showing decline uh, and, and in their 90s as well. So MLOD positivity seems to matter. Uh, pathology seems to matter, although there's other evidence suggesting that it's not as strong a factor as uh, it is in the younger population. But what does emerge is that even though FOE4, the influence of FOE4 goes down, the influence of FOE2 is uh, visible. That in fact, being FOE4-2 is protective. In fact, in odds ratio, there's a recent, recent report in fact, only uh, a couple of weeks ago in neurology, uh, which uh, uh, looked at uh, protect, uh, factors that uh, protected you in terms of being amyloid negative at extreme old age, say in, their, in your late 80s and 90s, uh, and being e, E2 positive uh, gave you odds ratio of about six of being e, uh, uh, amyloid negative. The other fact, most other factors did not emerge as being significant. The only other factor that was significant was pulse pressure, uh, being uh, having a high pulse pressure also was more likely to uh, be in um, MLR positive cases. But the effect size of this was in fact very small. Uh, FOE2 status was the one that was most significant. So FOE2 is, is quite interesting, and I think it's, it has, hasn't actually uh, attracted as much attention as FOE4. Uh, and maybe it, it kicks in later in life in terms of the protective effect. In our centenarians, we found that, in fact, nearly 16% are E2 positive. The general population is often less than 5%. So it's really uh, much more frequent. In fact, E4, General population is 20, 25% here, we only seen 13%. Uh, so certainly uh, they are enriched as far as E2 is concerned. And uh, E2, uh, people are beginning to look at E2, uh, functional E2 in terms of being neuroprotective. Uh, it is involved in down regulation of long-term potentiation related transcripts. It's been related to uh, upregulation of extracellular matrix or integrate in the transcripts. And there is some evidence that it helps the appearance of A beta. And we did a study looking at uh, lipidomics in the blood and related to FOE4 genotype and found that uh, phospholipid concentrations, especially uh, this phospho phosphatidylethanolamine PE subclass was elevated in the plasma. And there's some work suggesting that this also is uh, happening in the brain that phospholipids are increased. So perhaps that may be one targetable uh, uh, sort of uh, potential therapy in the future for uh, protection later in life. Look at other pathologies, uh, look at uh, say uh, infarction. This is from the Framingham study, you see rates of MRI, in MRI uh, uh, rate of infarction, prevalence goes up uh, significantly as you grow older. Uh, Microbleed, similarly, uh, much higher. Uh, you can see that uh, as, as you grow older, age 80 plus, uh, uh, in fact, at least, if you have at least one microbleed present in about a third of cases. And then you actually look at pathologies. Uh, the best data, of course, have come from uh, these two studies, the religious order and the memory aging study from Chicago. Uh, and uh, uh, they found that, and most of their participants actually in their 80s and early 90s. So you're looking at very old people when they're dying. And uh, uh, neuropathology was almost invariably present. And in fact, uh, there were, I think, only a handful of uh, individuals who had no pathology in their brain. And the majority had multiple pathologies. 94% uh, of the participants had at least 11 different pathologies. Rama's disease was the most frequent, but never occurred in isolation. Only 9% was abnormal pathology. And remarkably, there were, if you look at different combinations of pathology, there were over 230 different combinations available. And one pathology that is getting some attention also is hippocampal sclerosis uh, in very old people. Uh, 
and uh, this has been attributed by the vascular pathology or TDP43, and that's the other uh, protein that is attracting a lot of attention. Now, these are the various, some of the common pathologies in that group in the uh, Chicago studies uh, and, uh, uh, and the relationship of these to cognitive loss. Uh, these are univariate analyses you can see for and some protein is much more than 100 percent. You can see that various pathologies are contributing and usually it's a sum of these pathologies. Uh, and of the 35 percent who did not meet criteria for pathological AD, 21 percent of clinical AD dementia. So the clinical diagnosis did not always match the pathological diagnosis. And 44% uh, who had clinical AD dementia, approximately death, 70% did not meet pathological criteria. So we get hit it wrong in both directions. Uh, and this is more likely to occur in the very old, where there are multiple pathologies. And actually, when you look at pathologies in people with dementia, without dementia, and this is data from the MRC uh, CFAS study from the UK, uh, this is several years ago now, looking at pathologies in people with dementia and without dementia. Uh, and uh, uh, these are these are actually less than age 80 and still found that uh, in fact both groups had significant pathologies although there were some pathologies like the presence of Lewy bodies uh, that seem to tilt the balance uh, of course late stage prox uh, uh, staging also tilted the balance and also the 90 plus study uh, looked at their non-demented, they also have significant pathology. We don't have many pathology cases from our Sydney Centennial study. We only have about seven or eight cases so far. Uh, but they, they had a lot more, 104 cases in the 90 plus study. You look at their pathologies in the non-demented and the pathologies in the demented. You can see that uh, AD, really there wasn't much difference. So AD pathology in the two groups and uh, uh, mixed pathology, of course, was more common in the demented cases than non-demented cases. So let me stop here and we can have uh, time for discussion. Uh, so a few points I've made is that firstly, of course, the centenarians offer, offer us a unique opportunity to examine several questions in relation to the effects of aging on the brain and the impact of age-related pathologies. And the non-demented centenarian is a good model to examine successful brain aging. And centenarians show different degrees of resistance and resilience to pathology, and examining their determinants have the potential to yield insights into targetable interventions. And the relationship between structural and functional grade networks and the relationship in turn to cognition becomes less robust in extreme age. And uncovering the mechanisms for this could help in devising methods for recovery in the presence of brain disease. So I want to thank you very much. I'll stop here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, I will just.